This is episode four of the Women on Women in Art podcast series. These series are launched by the Institute of Art in the Arab World in collaboration with Lauha and the Moving Biography Summer School. My name is Yasmin Ta'an, and I have with me today Samia Halabi, who will tell us about her visit to Mona Saoudi studio in 1997 in Amman when she painted a 22 meter long rice paper scroll in homage to Mona Saoudi. She will tell us more about this project in a minute. Samia Halabi is a Palestinian artist who was born in Jerusalem in 1936 and is now based in New York. She is recognized as a pioneer of contemporary abstract art in the Arab world. She graduated from Indiana University with an MFA in painting. This was followed by 17 years of teaching in the US, the last 10 years of which were at Yale University. Halabi's work that is influenced by the Russian avant-garde movement is part of the Guggenheim Museum in New York and Abu Dhabi. It's also part of the Yale University Art Gallery, the National Gallery of Art in Washington DC, the Art Institute of Chicago, and the Institut du Monde Arabe in Paris, among many others. As for Mona Saoudi, she is a Jordanian sculptor who was born in 1945 and passed away in 2022. Mona graduated from the École Nationale Supérieure des Beaux-Arts in Paris in 1973. She moved to Beirut to join the growing art scene in the city in the 1960s. Her work was exhibited in galleries in Beirut, Paris, Kuwait, and the UAE. She also participated in group exhibitions at the National Museum of Women in the Arts in Washington, DC, and the Jordanian Contemporary Art in Ontario, Canada, among many others. Hello, Samia. Uh, hello, how are you, Yasmin? How are you? So today, I'm, we're communicating I'm from Beirut to New York. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So can you tell us a bit about this intriguing piece, the scroll that you painted during the, your visit to Mona Saoudi studio in 1997? Maybe you can start by this. Uh, well, Mona and I were good friends. I really, really miss her and I always valued her. But uh, as time goes by, after her passing, you begin an, a new evaluation. In a way, she was uh, almost a sister. Uh, and I remember one thing about Muna that was uh, always amazing. She's a, a very demanding friend and very precise about standards. And one day we were talking about friendship and she turns around and tells me, you know, Samia, if you weren't a painter, you wouldn't be my friend. <laughs> Which was a little shocking at first, but then I realized that our relationship and tight friendship was based on the fact that uh, she and I were both strong artists, really committed to our uh, studio production. I visited Muna a great deal, and Muna is the amazing person who introduced me to how to travel in the Arab world after decades of living away from the Arab world. One day I visited her new home in Amman, which she built by her own hands, and I had a Japanese rice paper scroll with me and some really nice brushes and i think i used not ink maybe i used ink i don't remember or black casein and i told her i was going to paint the whole house on the scroll and that i'm going to spend the day there and she can go about her business and i will go about my business she said okay we'll do that and then of course she went and i don't know where she went and i started painting uh what i saw and the first thing was uh, I were the trees uh, near the gate of the garden around the house. And then I sneaked into the back behind the house where there was a very narrow strip of land with a walkway. And I walked past it and recorded. And here I stop at the, you see the entire scroll here. And you see the early section where I'm walking in the backyard. And the uh, lemon tree in the middle was very important to me. And uh, Muna had decided that all the trees in her house 
would have names of her friends. She had limited number of people which she called her friends and she was dedicated to them no matter what they did. You know, she always forgave whatever they did because they were her friends. And this, and so we each chose a tree and I chose this uh, youthful looking lemon tree. And, uh, so uh, now and you're, taken, you're taking us through this trajectory of looking at the scroll. So we're looking at the scroll and you're describing, you know, the... the different the, parts of it. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, it's not a film of the scroll, but here I finished the walkway through the back of the house. And you can see on the extreme right that uh, the walkway had stones that she had collected and antiques here. You see the antiques. And as I walked around uh, through, I came to the front, past the front entry to the house, I found that Muna by now had done some morning chores and had made some, her iconic Miramiye, and she was sitting outside drinking Miramiye and reading the newspaper. And I drew that, and then I sat with her and we drank some Miramiye and chatted. And afterwards I departed and I departed to go upstairs. I think I missed a slide here. Let me go back. Sure. I departed and I went upstairs to her house. And here we're looking down at where we had just been sitting, drinking Miramiye and chatting under a tree that is obviously one of her friends. And uh, to the right, you see the many pottery antiques she has collected at the stairway that a few steps that go into the back door of her studio. Uh, from upstairs, I moved to other windows and I was looking down at the biggest tree in the yard, obviously a tree that was there long before the house was built. And this tree was uh, Dia's tree. And Dia is, of course, Dia Batal is uh, Muna's daughter. Mm -hmm. And this was Dia's tree. And you can see from the upstairs window, I see a car, uh, so it gives you the idea. Uh, the tree does not help you see that I'm far above, but the perspective of the car and the bucket over there. And then I come downstairs and go into her studio. And in the studio, I see works on paper distributed and more pottery. And the extreme right, you see some small sculptures of hers. And then to the left, I go down a few steps into the studio. And in the studio, I march through various parts of the studio. Here I stopped to show the sculpture that Muna called a lat, uh, that she described to me as being an ancient goddess of the Arabs. And, uh, and she is blindfolded. And Muna told me I sculpted her blindfolded because I didn't want her to see the mess contemporary Arab leaders have made of the Arab world. And as I move on to other parts of the studio, you, I recognize some of the sculptures here, possibly you do, some work on the paper. Here are two larger sculptures that apparently I spent a bit more time uh, drawing. And here is uh, are two trays full of her tools, her sculpting tools. And so I go on and on the extreme left here, you see the first silhouette of Muna. By the time I had gone through drawing half the studio and gone to the other end, I found Muna was already working on the sculptures. Here's Muna again with her iconic headdress and smock. Uh, and, and you see her in two spots. You see her uh, on top with just one eye showing as she walked behind the sculpture. I'm drawing very fast and she's moving very fast. Um, and in the next slide, you see her peeking from around the sculpture. And here we see her on the final stage of the scroll with some automatic tools. And finally, I show you this, which uh, indicates, uh, which is uh, written out a copy of, the of one of the many things she has written in Arabic on the walls of her studio. <laughs> عن التكوين الأول. Um, Muna loved stones. They were in her poetry. They were collected all over the house. They, she carved them. She wrote about them. She adored them. 
and they are typical of our um, our life uh, uh, in the Arab world, especially in Palestine. I, I don't see, I guess, the whole Arab world. There are parts of the Arab world that are uh, uh, desert rather than stone. But in Palestine, in Amman, many places, we live with stones and they became, became uh, somehow the heart of Muna Saudi's creativity. This is so interesting, Samia. Uh, it's, uh, I'm thinking about how you did this, this mise en, mise en abîme, kind of like a mise en abîme of a journey into the life of uh, Mona Saudi through, your, through the scroll, your, your art. And uh, it was uh, so interesting to see, actually, to see her actually doing things. And uh, I'm thinking about this, uh, this uh, uh, new dimension that you are uh, adding to the image that is, you know, these sequences. So it becomes more, in a way, time-based. You know, there is a certain sequence, so there is a certain story, a narration. Uh, you're moving and you're adding to the scroll. and. So I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about this artwork that is in between, I don't know how to call it, cinematic, painting, moving paintings, drawing, um, but drawing in movement, uh, happening. You don't know what's going to happen at the end, but you're producing it at the beginning. And it depends on how and where Mona is moving that your art is somehow uh, being produced. And I, I like that, you know, this... Uh... It's very interesting. It, there is something cinematic in a scroll, no matter what. Mm -hmm. And it is something that you read like a book. That is traditionally how it has been in the history of Japanese and Chinese mm -hmm. art. That the scroll is something you have set up in such a way that you can move through it. and. And, and there's text you read, you see pictures you read, it, it is time-based. And, and for me, the time base is very important because I've often had questions about how is it that we as abstract artists uh, are using the rectangle, which the Renaissance had defined as a window through which you see the world. Mm -hmm. and, and, and here there was another problem because uh, there is a certain sense of window. I'm here, I'm looking at the objects, I'm drawing them illusionistically. And so how is it that I'm going to go through different places? There were sections in the, in the drawing where it isn't a continuous scene, where a diagonal line between uh, being upstairs looking at Dia's tree and coming down to the studio. And uh, we didn't plan it, frankly, and I didn't know what the end would be. Uh, mm -hmm. She went about her business and I went about my business. She was conducting her day and I was making a work of art. So I ran into her when I saw her, when I came out from the back and saw her sitting. Of course, I went over there and drew her. And uh, then I continued. She left. I didn't know where she went or what she planned. Uh, and I went upstairs and then I came into the studio and I was in the studio for a while before she came to work. So it was, there was a certain happy coincidence that yeah. took place. But yes, now I, I see it in a more, you know, post event point of view. I, when I was doing it, I had no idea what would be the end or yeah. if I would even be able to fill the entire scroll. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. And also the fact that you are, through the scroll, you are allowing us, in a way, to enter Mona Saudi's uh, life, studio, work, uh, and, and look into her environment, her trees, her uh, dia, her friends. Uh, I, I thought that it was really interesting the way you laid out uh, this piece uh, in a podcast, <laughs> but maybe with some images. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Can you tell us a bit about the meeting when you met her in Norway in the exhibition that was organized by the PLO? Wh when was this and wh how was the encounter? You know, maybe tell us well, a bit I, about this. I have met Mona Saudi uh, long distance via uh, via letter. I, oh. uh, there was no email at the time. Yeah, I was. She wrote say. me, and she wanted some articles that I had written. 
to produce in a, in a magazine uh, mm -hmm. that was being published in Beirut during the revolutionary uprising. Uh, and, and I sent them. And so when I arrived in Beirut in 1979, I met her for the first time. And, uh, and uh, then 82 was when this show at the Kunsternishaus in Oslo took place. Mm -hmm. And she was late arriving and the group of artists there had met and decided that I can be their spokesperson until Muna came. And then when Muna came, she was exhausted. She was delayed because of border issues and being let out of Lebanon being, I don't think she had any problems being let into Norway, but she was delayed in Beirut and arrived exhausted and really very, very high about the show. It was something, one of the many wonderful things Muna did during the 70s was organize exhibitions. Uh, the greatest one of them, I'm sorry, I forget its name, has been her credit, her giving her credit for all she did at the time, mm -hmm. being head of the plastic arts sections of the PLO has never been sufficient in my point of view. She established a museum. She went around the world and got paintings from great artists, and especially Spanish artists who were very sympathetic. A lot of wonderful art was collected. And that space was bombed. And uh, she was heroic in rescuing the artwork uh, from that bombed out uh, the threat of a, uh, of this conditions of war in Beirut, people don't realize. Mm. And I remember I went to a talk being presented about this show and she refused to go because she knew that she wasn't going to be able to tell it, the, the events from her point of view. But I attended and I remember people asking uh, as though uh, it was such an important show, who had the opportunity to be in it? And I remember being in that show was something everybody avoided like the plague because they were revolutionary times and most artists were frightened to death to be associated with the Palestinian uprising. Mm -hmm. So instead of saying, why wasn't I in that show? The question is, why didn't you have the guts to be in that show? Mm -hmm. So I, my admiration for Mona and she didn't receive the proper uh, thanks for all that she, you know, the, the uh, evaluation of her very important contributions in that direction, I think have not been historically properly appreciated. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I admired her for all that. And, and I admired her for continuing and her for staying power. And she was indeed an artist. Nothing stopped the art pouring out from her yeah. and, and throughout her life from the very beginning. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing all this with us. Uh, is there anything else that you would like to add before we wrap up the podcast? Uh, just to thank you and thank the audience for their understanding and I enjoyed talking with you Yasmin and wish you the best with your efforts. Thank you. Other than that, you know, I might say there's going to be a large retrospective of my artwork in Sharjah opening in September 15th and the scroll will be on exhibits. It will occupy one room. I'm threatening them. You don't have a space big enough but they're going to make it go around the corner, around the corners and sort of like you can walk in a circle around the room. So it should be nice. Of course, this is great. I, I was wondering how you're going to fit 22 meter in a room, but uh, I'm curious to see and I'm definitely coming to Sharjah. That really Thanks. expresses what you asked first. You know, the, uh, the viewer will have to walk in order to see the scroll yeah. physically, they have to walk. It is a time-based artwork. Yes, okay. definitely. Thank you. We thank you so much. Thank you, Samuel. And thank yeah. you for listening to this podcast.